You were listening to an MLGA Network podcast. It was very customer servicey. Like I could do my Chick Fil A voice yeah. if you want to hear the Chick Fil A voice. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I absolutely it do. It goes. Uh, Thank you for choosing Chick Fil A. This is Cam. Not how I sound <laughs> oh, at God. all. <laughs> no. And if I were at the window, I would in my mind go, "Oh my God, listen to this asshole." Yeah. <laughs> and that's how I would be now. But I was like trying to impress the old bosses at that point. Oh, that's great. No, I was on the phone with a, a customer service rep for my insurance company the other day. And um, when we got off the phone, I told her, thank you. And she said, my pleasure. And then stopped herself. And she goes, I mean, you're welcome. Yeah. And I kind of laughed because I was like, you worked at Chick-fil-A. It, it <laughs> takes a lot of time to break that. I'm sure. Like, I'm sure. And, and that's the yeah. thing. People are like, why would you want to break it? It's such a, it's a good habit. And I was like, for two reasons. One, because it's very oddly formal and cheery and most people aren't prepared for mm -hmm. that and two there was a german guy that came into chick-fil-a one time and i gave him his food and he said S thank you i said oh my pleasure and he goes ew <laughs> please do not talk about your pleasure in front of me your pleasure <laughs> Welcome to Make Liberty Great Again, the best damn liberty podcast that you've never heard of. I'll be your guide as we peer into the ridiculous reality that is our society and our government. Let's get to it. Welcome to Make Liberty Great Again. I'm your host, Cam Harless, and with me today is one of my favorite guests that I've ever had, who is laughing at me right now because she loves my customer service voice that I start this show with. It was all of Chick-fil-A's fault, and it was not my pleasure. It was their pleasure. <laughs> Today, I have joining me Miss Jessica Green again, who Hi. is a lot of fun. And Jessica, yes. I've watched 54 horror movies. I am officially behind now for the first time. It's hard, isn't it? Well, it's not so much the amount of horror. It's, oh my God, how many bad movies can I watch in a row? <laughs> like, because some of these are just bad. <laughs> and that's more of my exhaustion at this point. Yeah, absolutely. But my goal is to beat your number, which you said was 57. 57, and I did that in 2017. So I have so, three more movies to uh, beat you or to match yes. you. So I need to, I have time, but that's my only goal is just to beat you. <laughs> it's even like, it's hard for me to keep up with posting the daily post about it yeah i just get like exhausted with it i'm like there's a list you'll figure it out <laughs> and they do they they know the deal the only thing i would want is just to know what day of the challenge it is because i don't want to sit there and count the days so i know how far behind i am yeah that's like it i need to figure out a system that it doesn't exhaust me because i always start out really ambitiously and i'm like i'm gonna post all the information about this movie the director the year it came out by the way you do put a lot of work into it, and I am willing to help you if you need help. Yeah, totally. Um, So I have another admin, but she becomes just as exhausted with it yeah. as I do. So we kind of just like leave people to their own devices <laughs> by the end. A lot of people have dropped out by the end, mm -hmm. too. So it, you know, it kind of takes pressure off of people because the majority of them have been like, hey, I can't actually watch 100 horror movies in a row. Yeah. Um, it is it is a hard challenge to do. And everybody thinks, oh, no problem. I can watch one movie a day. But it's hard to watch, A, people being murdered <laughs> for 100 nights in a row. And then, B, also, there's a lot of, like, trash, like, really trash acting. Yeah. And that was the thing. There was that movie. Uh, what was the one? Nightmare Cinema, I think is what it was called. Okay. Was that the the short story part? Yes. It was the little, the little anthology. Right. And the first story. There was story, trash in that. The first story was the only one worth watching. Okay. And so it was one of those things where I was like, you know, if you just made this feature length, I would have watched it. But I did right, watch right. the whole thing, but I was it seemed like every time you watched one it just got worse. But this is very inside baseball for horror movies, so I'm going to move past this now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I found maybe my favorite video on Twitter in the longest time the other day, and I wanted to share it share it with you. So this, I'm excited. This guy is named Cole Hirsch. I don't know if you've ever heard of Cole Hirsch. He, nah. he used to be on Vine. 
And now I don't know what he does. I just happened upon this video the other day. Okay. So there was a college, don't know where it is, called Saddleback College. And they were looking to change their mascot. And since it's COVID times, since it's the dark times in America, they had a Zoom meeting for people to talk about this. They're moving from the uh, gauchos. I don't know. I can't remember exactly. Guapos. I'm guapos. I don't know what it is. I think it was some kind of um, it's not great. Some kind of Mexican cowboy. Yeah, all right. To something, uh, some something else. And so they had a Zoom meeting, and one of the students at this school decided, you know what I'm going to do is I am going to send the Zoom link to Cole Hirsch and let him be on this call. And so this video is. And I'll, I'll share a link to the video so you can watch the faces on this. But there are okay. a lot of women in the in view. And he makes a very not PC pitch. <laughs> and it's it's I laughed so hard. So I, I'm going to play that for you now. <laughs> yes. Please give it to me. <laughs> Here we go. All right. Thank you so much, Cameron. Let's now welcome Cole Hirsch. Hi. How are you? Um, I have a little... I wrote a little pitch, if I could read through that. Please. Dear Saddleback College, let's face it, our mascot, the Gaucho, is racist, and it's time for him to be murdered. Anyway, I have just the idea for a new progressive mascot for your school. Her name is Titty Pussy, and she's a woke, sloppy goblin girl who rides around the campus on sweat-stained roller skates and begs each student to come out as bi. If a student refuses to do so, Titty Pussy will let out a shriek that has the frequency to change the student's body hair to strawberry blonde. <laughs> then Titty Pussy will say, Tough break, Straighty. Have fun Bitch sticking out laughing. like a sore thumb should you ever visit a beach in Palestine. At sporting events, instead of displaying <laughs> kiss cams on the Jumbotron, Titty Pussy will instead screen promos for her OnlyFans, which mainly consists of her getting off to the school flag. During halftime, Titty Pussy will do her signature dance move, the pop lock and swap it, where she'll make the team swap mouth guards to reassure the fans that none of the players are homophobic. If what? either team refuses, she'll take a knee for the rest of the game, uh, right in the middle of the field. <laughs> That's so <laughs> So, thank you for your time, and I hope you can consider Titty Pussy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Cole. Thank you. Let's you go ahead and welcome <laughs> Chloe Johnson. You thanked him for that. God bless America. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. oh, and he thanked him. It's so good. And, That's beautiful. But, but the beauty of it was if you watched the gender disparity in reaction, it was like, yeah. with the exception of one woman who was offended at first and confused and then started laughing because she and got then it. started laughing. But it was like all yeah. the men were just like holding back laughter <laughs> or laughing. It was... So beautiful. Well, it should be pointed out that the woman that was laughing was redheaded, yes. so she may have indeed been a libertarian. Uh, we we would need to confirm that to be yeah, sure. Female, redheaded, definitely a libertarian. Yeah. <laughs> the fact that she could get a joke, I mean, kind of, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so let me ask you a very serious question yes. here. So yes. Titty Pussy, uh, do you think that Titty Pussy would be a better candidate for president than uh, Boring Joe. <laughs> <laughs> um, titty Pussy would definitely get more attention than Boring Joe. That's for sure. I'm already more excited about Titty Pussy <laughs> than I am about Joe Jorgensen. Titty, titty Pussy has already given me more joy than Joe Jorgensen. Yes. And as we know, unless it sparks joy, we do not participate. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah no and and for everyone who's listening and i'm glad you said joe jorgensen because i have taken to exclusively calling joe jorgensen boring joe because that is what i think donald trump would call her if she was in the ill-fated joe rogan debate i think i think that that's true and i also think she's probably one of those people that you always say both their names yes like we all have that one friend that for some reason he's like both like you always say both names yeah it's like mike smith he's always mike smith he's never just mike um joe jorgensen's probably been like that since high school <laughs> and that's what's that's what was so funny is when i first heard of her it was like i was it was when i was doing more of the news stuff on this show and um yeah. it was 
I didn't pay much attention to her because it was a name I didn't know. And it just sounded kind of I just made sure she was female first by looking, to, you know, <laughs> with J.O. J my I would. Yeah, that's it's typically yeah. female, except for my nephew, whose middle name is Joe with a J.O. because he mm. was named after his grandmother. So I get. Oh, but it makes me it makes me check either way. But when she became the nominee my favorite joke was, well, the good thing about Joe Jorgensen is no matter what, whenever you say her name, you sound like you're stuttering. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, when she got the nomination, we were live on the Freckles and Brit show. Mm -hmm. And we were all just like, who? Like, there were six women on that panel, all libertarian women. And not a one of us had yep. heard of this woman. And interestingly, as we started to reach out on our Twitter accounts, being like, who is this bitch? All the LP people started being like, well, if you haven't been paying attention to the last eight months of debates, yeah. then, you know, we don't need you anyway. And I was like, well, that's kind of an interesting election strategy for people trying to find out more information about your candidate. But it's not the LP's purpose to elect a president. And it's definitely not their purpose to get libertarian ideas out there. So this is just kind of a... You know, as I kind of said before we started the recording, it seems like it's there to create a sabotage for there ever being a third party. As you know, anything to vote outside of the two party system, they're going to make sure that that just does not happen. If the LP isn't backed by the CIA, which, by the way, uh, Sarwark is tied to the CIA through some documents. But if it's not, oh, really? I can't imagine a better plan that the CIA could have come up with than putting Bill Weld and Gary Johnson <laughs> and Joe yeah. Jorgensen. If the CIA did come up with a plot, what would it look like? That's it yes. right there. Like they're probably they probably couldn't have even come up with something that good on their own. So I learned from my friend Josh Ferguson the other day something that really excited me and I, the double take that I gave him when I heard it was apparently fantastic and they were like man this should be video this should be video <laughs> but spike cohen his yeah. his actual name isn't spike i mean as you would assume spike's probably not his real name his real name is jeremy yeah he looks like a jeremy but in the 1980s when he was but a child he went and saw the movie um my little pony and in my little pony 1984 1986 i don't remember which there is a dragon in said movie named spike and apparently little jeremy cohen saw spike the dragon and said to himself boy that guy is brave and that's so precious <laughs> literally spike cohen took his name from my little pony God bless him. That is so precious. <laughs> it's, oh my God. It's so precious, but it's also hilarious since in my last episode, I described the LP as the worst political fandom and the bronies of political <sighs> philosophy. <laughs> I'm very angry at him for he appeared on a podcast with no shirt on and his nipples out. And I just don't think that's very dignified <laughs> for someone who's running for vice president, right? It's supposed to be all like, hey, I'm the cool guy here. <laughs> no, we have this reputation amongst libertarians already that we just get naked all over the place and you can't do an interview with your shirt on. I was very angry to see his nipples. <laughs> he's named after a cartoon dragon. From, and he's from named my after little a pony. cartoon dragon and he shows people his nipples <laughs> And it's, it's just not good. So an, another thing that I gleaned from my conversation with Josh was he actually went to the um, the Orlando Libertarian Convention in mm -hmm. July or whenever it was. And so he actually spent some time talking to Joe Jorgensen and he was sitting there at one point and someone asked Joe Jorgensen, I'm paraphrasing, I may not have the exact phrasing right here, but... Someone had asked her what her plan was and who she was going to aim for in this campaign. How are you going to do this? And um, if they were going to go after people on the right, disaffected people on the right, or people who'd voted for Trump. And she flat out told him, or this person who asked, no, that they were only going to be going after leftists because anyone who voted for Trump has is not going to vote for anyone but Trump. And so it's a waste of time 
to go after people on the right. That's garbage. That's that's absolute trash. For multiple reasons. Yeah, and that's more of the LP just basically telling anybody who might be interested in supporting it to go fuck themselves. Yeah. And, you know, again, why are you going to vote for people that hate you? Yeah. You know, why would you do that? And it's just a very great explanation for the BLM tweet for several different things that have happened, several missteps of the campaign so far. It's like, oh, okay, so you are just pandering to the left. That's your plan. Oh, openly. Yeah. Swarwork has, on multiple occasions, put out tweets about how they're just disinterested in libertarians who kind of lean Republican or who lean right. They're they're flat out not interested in conservatives at all. They think they see the direction that the wind is blowing, and they're trying to you know catch that headwind. I guess I don't know. I, not that I could. I don't believe that they're actually trying to do anything but subvert the you know the actual rise of a third party. So it doesn't matter what they do, honestly. It's and it's it's very f- foolish anyway. Let's let's say that Sarwark isn't just CIA plant. Because there are a lot of people in the LP who are stupid enough to think that the LP can win an election or are going to be an extreme <laughs> vehicle Aww, to teach. You're so sweet. <laughs> to teach libertarianism to the masses. People think that. I look at libertarians who are like honestly voting for Joe because they think she could win is just like the cutest <laughs> little things. That's so sweet, but you're dumb. I'm sorry. (laughs) And so people think this. People actually think that. And so if you just go after the left, first off, let's talk about the fact that, okay, of older libertarians, and by older, I don't mean age. I mean people who have been libertarian longer. I have been a libertarian. Ron Paul movement people. I've been a libertarian, and it just it got stronger since around, I think I started looking into libertarianism around 2007, 2008. And then I really learned Mm -hmm. of Ron Paul in, it was fake libertarianism. It was Glenn Beck libertarianism until I heard a speech by Ron Paul in about 2009, 2010, maybe. And so I've been in this libertarian world for well over a decade. Yeah, a long time. My question is, you are relatively new to libertarianism. Mm -hmm. And you actually came from the left, too. But looking at the demographics of the people that you have met and spent the most time talking to, one... As far as the left goes. As far as libertarians go. Oh, okay. How many libertarians do you know? How many have come directly from listening to Ron Paul? Most, I would say. An ass ton. And then secondarily, how many have you heard or how many have you met that... If they didn't listen to Ron Paul, they listened to people who came into libertarianism because of Ron Paul. I mean, there's definitely I know a lot of people who are Dave Smith yeah. converted. And he is a relatively recent player in terms of being like a media personality and putting out content. Yeah. Um, he got really popular only in like the last like two or three years, I would say. Yeah. So I know I know a ton, shit ton of people who were disaffected left who came over because of Dave. Yeah. And it's he doesn't just appeal to conservatives. And seeing him talking to Jimmy Dore like did my heart so much good. Yeah. Because I was like this is dangerous to the system that if these two start talking, these two fan groups <laughs> yeah. can unite, you know. Finally, how many libertarians do you know of that have gotten anywhere close to voluntarism, anarchism, agorism? etc that were converted by gary johnson oh um none yeah i know i i literally know of two people well no no one person one of them's just kind of a randian minarchist but very few there's one person i know of who went from gary johnson to rothbard gary johnson's one of those people that they point out when they want to point out why libertarianism sucks yeah And they pull up a video of Gary Johnson saying, what's in Aleppo? (laughs) And you're just like, oh, God, because like more libertarians than any of the other two party actually care about what's going on with foreign affairs and the U.S. having like prolonged military engagements in the Middle East. 
and we get represented by a guy who doesn't know what fucking Aleppo is. Yeah. So that to me is just like, okay, well, obviously this is just like, you know, sabotage of some form. Yeah. I don't know how it works, but it's clear that these people will lie, ste- steal, cheat, and kill um, in order to keep the two-party system going. So it wouldn't surprise me. I don't put anything past them, right. let's just say. If I hear the word duopoly one more time, I'm going to lose my fucking <laughs> mind. As yeah. if adding another <laughs> choice to the ballot is what's going to make us free. No, no, and it, and it wouldn't. No. no. And so like, I'm I'm kind of in this place. Like the last episode that I put out was with Kim and we talked about cuties and we talked about Mm -hmm. um, child sex trafficking, stuff like that. And I found out like after I finished recording that I saw a Christian guy on my Facebook talking about how all parents should watch cuties because it teaches this or this lesson of not sexualizing children. And I was, and I realized in that moment that right now I am in between that and my disdain for voting in general i am in like an all-out war against utilitarianism (laughs) i i cannot do the ends justify the means yes trump has been good for america insofar as he's unmasked the corporate press the cathedral all of these things the the npcs but it's not worth it's not worth it to me to sign off on what's going on in yemen yeah i can't sign my name to that so I can't vote sure. for him. I can't vote. And, and I'm just not going to vote for anyone. Because the, the LP, from the beginning, yes, Rothbard was a part of it. Yes, he walked away. But it's by nature a statist organization. It's by nature yeah. a, a, I mean, you could say, oh, well, it's for teaching, which I think is not the best vehicle unless you're in the Republican Party, a la Ron Paul, where you get a huge platform. Mm-hmm. But- By nature, they want to take over the state and force people to do things they want them to do. You want to install a power figure, which the purpose is to control this monopoly of violence. Right. And I'm not into that. And so, like, I've just realized I'm in this this war against the ends justify the means. Because learning that child exploitation is bad, it's a good thing to learn. But you don't have to sexualize Mm -hmm. children to learn that lesson. You don't have to watch sexualized children to learn that lesson. I mean, by all means, make a documentary about toddlers and tiaras. Make a documentary about dance moms or whatever. Like, and I think we're all ready for that. We all know, yeah, you know, that's that's not okay. But there is a huge push to kind of normalize this stuff, which I think is emblematic with cuties and stuff like that. I think to the point of signing off on Trump, Mm -hmm. which you know, I I I know a lot of people, especially like libertarians or anarcho people i see a moral justification for trying to vote for trump yeah. especially if you kind of step back and you look at this overall big picture of like the encroaching marxism and the violence and all of those kinds of things i i do see yeah why someone would and don't at all blame them for it, right yeah and, and like another good thing is just the delegitimization of the office of the presidency and having sure. a person like I can't tell you how many people that I've known that were more or less, they were more or less on the right before Trump who were now shifting Mm -hmm. to the left because of Trump. But it's, it's not those people that learned the lesson, but there are people out there who see a, what they see as a bumbling idiot with the nuclear button and go, why is this person making war for me? But then they get their notes from the corporate press when he drops the mother of all bombs in Afghanistan, that it's the first time he's ever been presidential. So I had this conversation the other day, not necessarily a conversation, but as a brief tweet exchange on a thread of Pete Canonez's, yeah, where we were kind of talking amongst ourselves about how, you know, you're never going to be anarchist enough or libertarian enough for anybody. So like, just do what you got to do. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, just because you philosophically believe that it is always better to solve our problems without the state, you believe that we can do a lot of these things privately, doesn't mean that you don't acknowledge that we live in a state yeah. and have a preference for which way that state right. turns. And you can't be faulted for trying to influence that in some way. Yeah. And I heard the comparison made that like if you were in prison, and you were being served, you know, shit sandwiches or macaroni and cheese, you might 
have a vote yeah. and choose macaroni and cheese, it doesn't mean you consent to being yeah. in a prison, you know? I think it's Block, the Officer Goody versus Officer Batty argument. Okay. Um, which, okay. which, you know, I, I think that there are people who fall on different philosophical grounds when it comes to voting. And, you know, all, all more power to you. If you think that it's going to work, you do, you do you. For me, I can't do it. And my tact is not ever going to be political. Because I think... Sure. Before political change can happen, it has to be a cultural shift. There has to be a, there has to be a lot, but I would much rather live my life the way that I want it to in the Harry Brown sense of the term and go kind of more or less agorist, even though I, I've just dropped all the labels at this point. I'd, I'd much rather see what I can do to make myself free and me and my family prosperous and share that with others and inspire them to reject the state and to get around the state then i would like i'm not going to say hey don't vote i might but it's going to be towards the people who are going to listen to it towards the people mm -hmm. like like my friend thaddeus who is so mad at the lp for pushing and being hostile towards the right yet was willing mm -hmm. to vote for joe jorgensen because she was team libertarian yeah and you know we had a long conversation not an argument i just me and uh, my friend Josh just made the point that you voting for them is just telling them, yes, this is okay. Using this tact is okay. Yeah. So multiple things. I think this is a case of where multiple things can be true at the same time. It's both sort of fruitless because of the way that statistics work and numbers shake out. Yeah. It's fruitless because presidential elections are not necessarily decided by popular votes and for good reason. Well, they're not because Hillary Clinton, more more Americans wanted Hillary Clinton than they did Donald Trump. Yeah, she won the popular vote. Yeah. There's no disputing that. But um, I think that in that situation, the Electoral College functioned exactly as it was supposed to. Yes. And somehow... These men who lived 200 years ago put a safeguard into this legal system <laughs> that actually functioned. And um, I think that that's a goddamn miracle that we should appreciate. Well, and it's 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 it was very well planned in so far as it was looking at the needs and the desires of the states rather than the people, because the states created the federal government. The federal government did not create the original states. Sure, they may have created some later, but the yeah. Constitution was, first off, a coup and a conspiracy. Yes. But secondly, yes. it was the states ratifying and creating a federal government. So, you know, until I forget which amendment it is, I want to say the 16th, when they changed the voting for senators. Well, they changed it to be a, a popular vote to elect senators to be popular vote. instead right. of appointed yeah. by the states. And so that was one thing that was lost, but the Electoral College was another portion of that. It was to give the states a voice rather than just the popular vote. The popular vote was a means to tell the state what the people wanted. And then the people who right. ran the state, and I'm not, I'm not a big fan of elites, but the people who ran the state, the elites, knew what the state needed better than just your average Joe. Well, I've never understood the logical argument for... A popularity contest decided by the masses being any kind of way that we should decide no, absolutely <laughs> as a group not. what we do. <laughs> that seems ridiculous. There's no logical argument for doing that. And it seems like almost like a, a scarlet letter if you say democracy doesn't actually sound like a good idea. What would you replace it with is, of course, the first question. And uh, this or the comment, well, what do you want to go back to monarchy? And in some ways you know, one monarch is a lot easier to unseat than 300 monarchs. Or 300 million voters, because I think... Or 300 million voters. The vote, the popular vote, all of that, I think it was a way to make the lie of we the people more real to mm -hmm. the populace. Because sure, they wanted absolutely. people... Like, I'm not, I'm not anti-founder. I think that there were some very brilliant men who were founders of the american system and the american the country not the nation fuck that nomenclature oh dear god but yeah. i think that we the people is just the biggest lie that we believe because you know i think it was rothbard that had said well you know if it was the people that are the government then it was all the jews in germany committed suicide yeah 
that argument that if 75% of the population elects to kill 25% of the population, did they, the people, decide that they were going to be extinguished? Of course not. Right. We don't belabor the point is what Rothbard's actual words were. And I thought, yeah, I mean, that's so obvious yeah. that it, it wouldn't be that way. And so I think the popular vote and I think the way we typically run things is a means to indoctrinate the people into feeling that they're actually they actually have power and that they have a say. I think it's more of a way to placate people than it is to actually decide anything. And the Democrats obviously want that to change because they hold all the indo indoctrination tools. They hold the power in all of those ways. And if they had their way, California would choose and New York would choose every election, would choose everything yeah. for everyone. I was I'm in Florida. I was born and raised in Alabama, and I can tell you, I'll be damned if I let a Californian choose how my life looks. I'll be... And that's what I'm... I'll be especially damned if I let Europeans do it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I meant by the Electoral College functioning as intended, because it actually protected the people in what were, you know, so degradingly named flyover country... Yeah. From the people on the coast who think that, well, we, you uneducated Luddites need us to bring you kicking and screaming into the future that we've decided for you, which is also going to be drag queens reading story time to your children. Drag queen story hour. Yeah. And, you know, I think that that's a little alarming for some people. They might not want that for their lives. So why can't Georgia be Georgia and California be California? It's time. This whole national system is yes. a complete farce. There is Absolutely. no way that one town with a little over 500 people can run the lives and tell people what to do. 30, 300 million plus people. There are 50 states that all think differently. They may pretend that they think the same, but that's 50 different cultures. And then you, then you look at the states and you mm -hmm. realize Atlanta is a different culture than Athens. Or yeah, it's, absolutely. It's, it, uh, Birmingham is a different culture than Huntsville or Mobile. Like all of these places, it's it's like saying that there are fifty different cultures is a vast understatement. So absolutely. why would we think that one president, a Congress, whatever, could possibly ever represent everyone in America? And this is something that I bring up when Democrat or leftist friends of mine complain about Donald Trump. They'll say all of the terrible things that he's doing. And I know that the standard move is to say, well, Obama was doing that stuff, too, yeah. which is true. But it's going to turn your leftist friends right off. Yeah, it's going to turn them right off. So what I say to them is, doesn't it kind of point out why we shouldn't have all of this power gathered under one person? Because look at how this horrible man has gotten in here and used this power. So doesn't it kind of point out that centralizing all this power is a really bad idea? And from there, you can talk about decentralization. And if you're very, very clever, <laughs> you won't call it secession. <laughs> and then you might make some headway with your right. leftist friends. But if you slip up right. and you call it secession, you're out. Because secession was demonized by Abraham Lincoln as pro-slavery and racist, even though the first states to talk recession were northern states. Well, he said this bullshit about a house divided against itself cannot stand. But right down the street from me is an old couple. And one of them is a Georgia fan. And the other <laughs> one is a Georgia Tech fan. And they live in the same house. And they have all this like competing Georgia Tech, Georgia stuff in their yard. And they're the cutest thing. So I know that a house divided against itself can stand and be really cute about it. Well, yeah. And that's just importing biblical conversation into politics, <laughs> which is like, Horrible, because, you know, the, the the origin of that statement is talking about Satan and God being coexisting in one person. Oh, shit. I didn't realize that. That is some diabolical framing. Oh, oh well, and so, wow. yeah, that, that comes out of a time when they were talking directly about Jesus and saying that when he was casting out demons or um, healing people, he was doing it using the power of Satan and that he wasn't it wasn't from God. And so... Oh, I know what you're talking. I know what part yeah, you're talking so about. Yeah, so the statement was a house divided. You know, essentially the house divided against itself cannot stand. That's a common theme, too, about how one cannot serve two masters. Right. During the Civil War, I mean, if you look at the original version of the um, the hymn, what's it called? The um, 
Battle Hymn of the Republic. The Battle Hymn of the Republic. Like, first off, the tune was a song. Jenks, you owe me a coat. <laughs> the tune was from a song about John Brown who killed people in order to start a war because he was an abolitionist. Pro, I guess he was pro-life in some demented sense. Yeah. But if you actually read the ly- the full lyrics of that, it's a very eschatological song. It's a very, it's a song about. Do you es- mean what I think you mean? Eschatological meaning eschatology, not poo poo. <laughs> okay. okay um i just needed to clarify yeah apocalyptic it was this concept okay. of which is why i don't like it when people say eschatological i would vastly prefer saying eschatological but everyone says it well that it way. sends the wrong message <laughs> and i agree which is why i don't like it but i'm like if i say this wrong i'm going to be made fun of Aww. but the whole idea was that the union in that the army were essentially the hand of god dealing out judgment and mm. so, and if you look at political rhetoric over the years, that was a common, common belief for that time and era yeah. too. If you look at like in Europe, the wars in Europe, they would, yeah, God's on our side. It's dastardly. Yeah. And if you look at, I think it was Reagan who called America the shining city of the hill, which is taking Christian language and using it yes. for politics, which is diabolical, awful. Yep. Don't do that. <laughs> it's a main complaint of atheists too, that when they're looking at this the terribleness of the system and how they use Christianity, they kind of lay that blame on Christians. Mm. That like Christians are doing this to the government. I'm like, no, they're using Christians. Yes, exactly. But yeah, I'm not sure how we got there. Well, we were going to talk about them doing that anyway. (laughs) Oh, yeah, because apparently it was a trending topic to tell Christians that they weren't Christ-like on Twitter. And I wouldn't have known that if it weren't for seeing your tweets. Yeah. Because I was, because I've seen that so much in my life that it's like, like, because that's what a lot of atheists will do, which is so weird. It's like, oh, so you're going to try to hold me to a standard you don't hold while in a sense that you don't understand more or less giving validity to Christianity. Yeah, it's in the same breath. They're making Jesus Christ the ultimate moral standard without holding themselves to that moral standard. But they're going to hold you to yeah, it. It's horrible. And I hate that. And they say, well, it's your standard. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's one that you made up for me. Well, it's like, and it's always like, oh, well, Jesus said to feed the poor. And it's like, oh, yeah, by that, right. he meant he that sure the did. Romans should be taxing you so that you don't have to be the one who feeds the poor. Like, it's always these very statist, sort of the state, you know, responses to injustice, which is a personal call in the Bible. People use the state to get out of all sorts of responsibilities. And this COVID thing really pointed out to me the way that people rely on the state as a daycare and to watch their children and to educate their children. Not that I'm putting the blame on them for that. That's the system that they came up in. So they thought that they would be able to rely on it. And when they couldn't rely on it for just a couple of months, it's thrown people's lives into hell and chaos. And we're going to have some hard times, but we're going to have to learn. We can't rely on the state for these things. Absolutely. Let me ask you a question. There are a lot of people on Twitter who are school choice activists or even Mm -hmm. pro-homeschooling who are counting this coronavirus deal and more people homeschooling as an absolute win, which I see some aspect of that being true. But do you see that as an absolute win? Because when I see this, first, I am very well aware of the fact that even though these kids are being homeschooled, they're still getting their indoctrination straight from the source. And they're just in their house. It's just been imported into their house rather than them having a different kind of education. I mean, that's true. But you're not going to get these things with a bow on them. They're not going to come the way that we would ideally hope for them as libertarians necessarily. Mm -hmm. Like it is a win in the sense that more kids will be at home being educated by their parents and maybe a percentage of those parents in that time will say, you know what, it's actually better for my kid if I do this. And not experiencing so much peer violence. Right, peer violence, all those kinds of things. And for some kids, it's going to be a big relief to go back to school. Yes. Okay, so this is not something like I admit a lot, (laughs) but... Um, I was a little bit neglected as a child Mm -hmm. and not fed properly, and I got most of my meals at school. And so even though I am now an anarchist who believes that, you know, we can do that sort of thing with charity, I came up in a system where I was grateful for that food. And there are kids currently who are not 
you know, there's no system in place to catch them. So they are suffering and it's not their fault that this whole system is the way that it is. Right. And that's why I've been saying more or less since this started that right now is the best time for libertarians and anarchists to go, hey, let's start instituting some stuff. Like, look at the BLM things, people wanting to defund the police. How good would it be right now for a few anarchists out there who have the skills to do it to go, hey, I'm going to set up a private police firm in my neighborhood? Sure. Something like that is ins insanely difficult, but it wouldn't necessarily be as difficult to set up like a food bank. Right. Or, yeah, you know, school supply bank or just anything that can make people who aren't necessarily prepared to deal with the rug being pulled out from underneath them to get through this and to maybe like realize that they can do it on their own right and i do think that it would be difficult to do that but i mean but my point is right now we have the golden opportunity for people who have these skills for people who have these drives to go hey i can show the whole world that voluntary solutions work I can show the world that voluntary solutions can be better than what we've got right now. I feel like there are a lot of people who are focusing on Joe Jorgensen and focusing on presidents when mm -hmm. we could be looking at, hey, how do we prove the metal of libertarianism, of anarchism, right. of right. voluntarism, agorism, etc. One thing I'm kind of known for amongst my friend group is that I... Uh, do the doomsday prepper thing, mm -hmm. which I I don't I don't go to any kinds of those extremes and I don't believe in like a apocalyptic scenario, but I have been through storms. Yeah. And I do realize that you can get cut off for a couple of days and if you don't have any supplies because you're a waitress and you're used to eating at work, five days stuck in your house is really going to suck. Yeah. So that's the kind of prepper that I am is just I live in the real world and I understand that I live in like a storm right. region. So since all of this stuff has started, I have seen an increasing number of people kind of asking me my advice about what they would do. And these aren't people, these are like your normies, you yeah. know, like your NPC type people, but they're still like, hey, if I were just starting out, what would you recommend doing? So there's like kind of an awareness growing amongst people that the system that we have is not necessarily as reliable as they've come to believe it is or... You know, the edifice is cracking. Yeah. So for whatever that means. The mask is dropping. Um, the mask is dropping and people are starting to realize that they're going to need to do some things on their own. And that's a good sign. I don't want there to be a collapse. I don't want there to be a boogaloo yeah. or a civil war, unpeaceful transfers of power. That is not going to be good news for anybody. And it's all well and good to joke about that stuff, but it's not going to be so funny if you're fighting your neighbor for food. Right. Like that's not a hilarious scenario that we're going to be posting on Twitter about. That was one of the reasons I decided to move from Pennsylvania. Because we were living in a row house on in the middle of the city around a lot of people and it was one of mm -hmm. those things where did I think that we were all going to run out of food with the coronavirus and things were going to be bad blah blah blah. Not necessarily. But if something like that happened, I wanted to be able to have the space to take care of my family. I didn't want the nice next door neighbor to come up with a baseball bat and say, hey, I need some bread. No. I didn't want that. And that's part of the reason why I'm like, yeah, I wanted to get out of there. There's a reason that there's a line in one of the Batman films where the Heath Ledger Joker one mm -hmm. Where he talks about, and the reason this line is so popular is because it rings true in a lot of people's ears, which is when the chips are down, these civilized people will eat each other. Mm -hmm. And that's such a popular line <laughs> because we all know it's true. I will eat your leftist ass like corn on the cob. <laughs> there we go. God bless you, Alex Jones. He's my favorite. I'm. Twitter is a much uh, poorer place without Alex Jones, I'll say that. <laughs> Yeah, these civilized people, though, they'll, they'll eat each other. So, like, wanting any any kind of, like, collapse to happen is not... So, in lieu of a collapse, there needs to be some kind of piecemeal process. And that means making peace with the idea that you don't get everything sort of wrapped in a libertari ideal libertarian bow. Right. Because if a civil war does break out, it's not going to be between 
liberty minded people and the authoritarians and we're going to be the plucky heroes in our own story <laughs> it's going to be one kind of authoritarian versus another kind of authoritarian and you're probably all going to get killed in the process yeah. so like don't wish that on yourselves don't wish that on anybody and trust me most of y'all are old and have bad knees <laughs> like you're not going to be rambo get that idea out of your heads it's ridiculous <laughs> yeah and i think that if there was a civil war it would be easily the fattest civil war of all time <laughs> y'all need insulin half y'all need insulin you got bad knees don't talk at me about how you're gonna you know use all these big guns that you have you can't run for longer than 15 minutes you're not gonna boog okay yeah and well and that's the thing like i see kids being home from school as a win absolutely oh that's what we were talking about i just like it a little bit better when they didn't have to do school at home and like it's the it's the the indoctrination is a huge issue. So it's like half of a win. This is not homeschool. Just yes, to be and that's clear. what I'm the saying. School at home yeah. is a, a separate term from homeschool because that you know them. Have you seen that picture? That poor kid crying as he's sitting in front of the computer trying to like adjust himself to this like strange environment that he has to be in. It's awful for them. Yes. This this Zoom learning is is terrible for children and it's got nothing to do with homeschool. I'm hoping that enough miserable crying children convince their parents out of love to get them off of there and be like, you know what, let's go tour a historical site today right. instead. Let's go take a walk in the woods and see if we can name four types of trees together. You can learn along with your kid. You don't have to be a professor. Yeah. You can be like, we're going to learn how to make scrambled eggs today. Yep. You know, like well, We caught... Uh, bugs the other day we caught a moth there you go bot it was a banded sphinx moth and it was kind of fun to find they i didn't want to touch it because i don't i i have this weird thing about things with tiny legs or tiny feet i don't want them <laughs> like i i think it came yeah. from the time that i held the tarantula but after that oh. i have not been able to deal with anything in my hand that has tiny feet like I, it's strange uh -huh. but i can't do it but I used to catch crickets all the time. Like, I was always catching bugs. But now I'm like, yeah. oh, lizards? Fuck that. <laughs> Literally, you are teaching your kids more biology by catching bugs in a jar with them and then finding out what their names are than yeah. any school is going to teach them in numbers of years. People are not using school for education. They're using school as a babysitter. Yes. And that is not the same thing. And people need to be honest about that. You can teach your kid to multiply. Like you were taught how to multiply, you can teach your kid. Mm -hmm. Okay. If, 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 they, who is it that said if school started teaching babies to walk within a generation, they would say that babies wouldn't be able to learn to walk without school? I think it was Woods. Kid, people, kids pick up on reading and things like that just by being around you. Right. You're reading things, you're looking at things. So if you're reading books and you're, you're being an example, to them, they will do the things that you're doing. So if you want your kids to read, you read. Well, it's like with my kids, you know, I do read to them. But one of the things that I'll refuse to read to them, because I think they need to do this themselves, is video games. You're trying to have fun. Oh, I'm not going to read clever. this to you. Right. If you want to know right. what this says, if you want to know what buttons to push, got to learn your letters, bro. And And they will. That will inspire them to learn faster than anybody who's forcing them to read a book that they're not interested in. Yep. And so much of public education has been geared at girls. This is a little off topic, but it's been geared at girls. And so it's been focused on the way that they want to learn, which is different than the way that boys want to learn. By sitting still. By yeah, by sitting yeah. still and reading literature. Boys are not interested in literature. They're interested in like lists of facts and 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 stories Comic about books. Story. yeah like adve high adventure i'm not saying that girls can't be interested in those things too of course they can i was a perfect tomboy <laughs> as a youth i didn't want anything to do with girl things my whole youth oh so you're transgender and today they would take a girl like me and they would have said oh well you're actually a boy and let and an impressionable youngster like myself might have fallen for that and thank god that i didn't because as an adult i'm actually quite a bit more feminine yeah. than i was as a child it's like those hormones do something when they hit you yeah that's right even though you know? from a young age even though i'm sure my daughter who is 18 months old now 
will be more tomboy because of her older brothers. There is a stark difference between baby Lorelai than there was between Ezra or Soren or any of my boys. Like, sure. There's a Absolutely. very marked difference. Like, my boys know that they're cute. They do not know that they're cute like my 18-month-old daughter knows. <laughs> I weirdly understand that. Yeah. She knows how to use it. Like they never have. Yep. And it's like, wow, <laughs> you're good at this little girl. Yeah. <laughs> Let me give you everything. And there's no way to standardize learning for children because each child is so different because Lorelai will learn so differently that Ezra will learn. Yeah. And it's not fair to force them both into a box that's made for the most common denominator. Yeah. That's a ridiculous way to teach children and it cuts off their potential and it prevents them from doing the things that excel for them. Like what if what if one of them is like exceedingly interested at pottery and that's all they want to do and they're just like the best potter in the world? Are we going to like sit them down and slam them into a chair and be like, no, you have to learn poetry? Like that's silly. You have to learn advanced calculus. Why? Who the? Yeah. Why? Yeah, because so many of us are using the advanced calculus, right? Right. Like, That's for a very special type <laughs> of person. <laughs> right. My husband's that type of person, and he would have done that without school having ever been there. He sought those books out on his own long after high school had ended. Yep. So I, I, I'm very critical of public school, and I don't see... The school at home is necessarily like the solution, but it's a step in the right yeah. direction. Absolute win is too strong. It's a half win. Step in the right direction. Yeah, step in the right direction. Yeah. And that's that's all I'm getting at because I see some people calling it like, oh, we've won. Homeschooling is up 200%. And it's like, but is it? No. If you even look at learning styles, like even if kids have different desires in, of learning of different things they're interested in, they still yeah. have different styles of learning. Like you and I probably have some very similar interests, but I probably don't learn the same way you do. I might. I was that kid who could just sit in the, a classroom like a sponge and barely pay attention and always make A's. That was just me. Yeah. I was cursed with that being smart where I didn't have to work for it. Or was it that your curriculum was reduced to what the slowest kid in the class could keep up with? Hmm. And, you know, you might not have been a genius, but you certainly fell somewhere ahead of the uh, nominal curve yeah. of individuals. Yeah. And it was absolutely unfair to make you waste the most neuroplastic years of your brain's life in boredom in service to the dumbest kid in the class. I hated school and I was convinced that I hated learning. And that's a crime. That's a crime. And what was funny is and then so I was in private school actually i've never i've never been in a public school my brother was i've known most of my friends have been in public school and i know what it is i don't have to have gone to public school to know what it is because i've known these people it's like malice says and i put on my facebook every now and then and lose a teacher friend you know schools are literal prisons for children and the only place that most people will experience violence from their peers that's certainly true for me i yeah that's the only place in my life I've ever experienced violence. Right. And so I, I understand that. And even being in a private school, I was still indoctrinated, just in a slightly mm -hmm. different way. But I, was, I started being homeschooled right after seventh grade. And my mom started pulling out, like, I think his name's Richard Mayberry books, like Whatever Happened to Penny Candy, and then Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and these different books that everyone's heard of at this point, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But... My mom essentially taught me the non-aggression principle without knowing it. Yeah. And in different words. Because it kind of comes from Christianity. Right. Well, there's that too. But, <laughs> but, but even, even, <laughs> even like in a secular way talking about it. And then yeah. she also was like, you know, and this is called Austrian economics when I was a kid. And I was like, oh, interesting. And so when I heard Austrian economics later on, I was like, oh, I know what this is. And this is what made sense when I learned about it earlier. And so I was able to, yeah. and I, I was like, do you know that you made an anarchist mom? And she's like, please, Cam, <laughs> just vote for Trump, please. <laughs> like, no, I'm not going to vote, mom. <laughs> uh, friend of mine's mo mother passed away and she was a big, big Trump fan. And then I'm half tempted. 
I'm like, Gina would have voted for Trump. <laughs> I should go make sure her vote counts. <laughs> Well, it's like the other day, I had a long conversation slash argument about voting with my mom because I love her very much, but she's under this impression that if she prays and feels like she has gotten direction from God, that that's the only direction and that no one, that I don't have a different feeling for these things, right? Or I don't, I, I haven't prayed through Czar it. Tsar Nicholas felt that way right before they shot him. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, I was having this long conversation. And then right after it, I told a couple of friends, I was like, yeah, I just had the uh, Trump prophecy conversation with my mom and how wow. I need to vote for Trump. And today, when we're recording this, is actually the one year anniversary of my dad's death. And so my immediate response when I was talking to these people, I was like, well, at least my dad's dead. So I don't have to have this conversation twice. <laughs> Shit. Oh, fuck no. <laughs> Welcome to my dark mind. <laughs> no, I mean, that, that Trump prophecy shit is age group specific. Like, there is a certain Some group boomer of people. Shit. Yeah, you got to be 50 plus to uh, subscribe to the Trump prophecy stuff. But, you know, again, like I said, I know, I know that there is a definite visible marked march toward like progressive oh yeah postmodern whatever you want to call it we all know that the ground is rumbling and everybody is sort of like grasping for life vests and life jackets right now yeah. and a lot of people think that that comes in the form of donald trump yeah and i kind of earlier when you were talking about joe jorgensen or like what a third party might do i think that anything that a third party shakeup might accomplish is actually being accomplished with trump yeah He's clearly something outside of the power structure. I, I don't remember which CNN guy said it, but somebody kind of likened Trump's election to a stick of dynamite being rolled into Washington. And it certainly has unveiled a lot of things that cannot go back into the bottle yes. now that they're out. I have tried to tell this to people so much recently. Trump, not the greatest guy. He continued the the, the atrocities in Yemen. He continued. He, we're still in Afghanistan. We're still in Iraq. We're still everywhere. Yeah. that Obama was. Yeah. But he has delegitimized the presidency. He kneecapped the Bushes. He kneecapped the Clintons. He hasn't started any new wars. So there's like absolutely some less bad things about Trump. I don't want to necessarily say better because I don't know if all of what he's doing is in, in, completely intentional. Yeah. It's like just by being who he is, he has changed how things are and how things will be. And I've had this argument with people Time and time again, we are not going back to Mitt Romney. No. It won't happen. The toothpaste does not go back in the tube right. after this. And I'm glad someone agrees with me because I keep having this argument. They're like, oh, no, people want to go back to no. normalcy. I'm like, if Joe Biden wins, there are going to be enough people on the right, just like there have been on the left with Trump, who are going to screech and make things hell for other people. I think it's a mistake to believe that the hard left is going to stop screeching. Oh, no, they're going to keep screeching. I mean, yeah, if you look at some of these people, they... Talk about how Bernie Sanders was the compromise. They they embraced the imagery of the guillotine. Something has been let out of the bottle here that like people. OK, let me stop and go back real quick. I think people who are voting for Biden are like nominal Democrat type people who just want everything to go back to normal. Yeah. And God bless those people. They're well-meaning, but they're dumb. What has been unleashed since the early 2000s as far as like critical race theory, postmodernism, Marxism, all of this stuff has been in works since the 50s and 60s. We have been uh, slowly and incrementally through our systems been infiltrated by communism. And I know I sound like I'm wearing a tinfoil no, hat right it's now. It's the but facts. It's absolutely true. It's the facts. McCarthyism was real. It was real. And they believed that the U.S. would never need to be fought in a war, that it would fall into their hands like a ripe fruit from within. They weren't after you. They were after your children. Yes. And they radicalized your children. And now they are going to come to cut your fucking heads off because you've allowed them to be taught by people who are not you. Yes. And they've been taught to hate you. They've been taught to hate their parents. That's why you see these kids on TikTok filming their own parents as they denigrate them on the internet what's that girl's name um the one uh kellyanne conway her daughter claudia oh, i don't know if you've heard of this God. but she got all over tiktok and probably twitter and instagram i don't know i just saw the tiktok stuff because i am yeah. a millennial who scrolls tiktok yeah <laughs> 
how could you not? I mean, it's people watching disaster. It's great. It's, I, I love it. And I spend too much time on it. But it's <laughs> it's perfectly emblematic of the personal is the political made flesh. And <laughs> I despise that because let's talk about the personal is the political for a second. Because every time I say that that's a, to, like Malice said in his book, it's a totalitarian lie that I reject entirely. People are like, mm -hmm. oh, well, but it's true. Sort of. But you don't give the left that because it started from the left. It started from the ra it started from radical feminism to make women to browbeat women into voting the way they wanted them to. It's a leftist tool. And if you go, oh, well, but it's true. What you're doing is giving validity to something that was not true the way it was originally intended. So I do see the truth in the claim that when people are affected by a topic that they're going to be more emotional about it, which is something you hear from the left all the time. This this topic affects me more than it affects you. Yeah. But when did we as a culture decide that the people who could be least objective of all people about a topic decided the direction that that topic would go? It seems really um, stupid to <laughs> take the people who can't discuss it objectively and say, you control the conversation. That's part of the plan, though, is because when they sure. tell people this, when they tell people that the personal is political and you should vote pro-choice because you're a woman and otherwise you're voting against your interest. Shit is so sexist. Or you're black, so you should vote Democrat or you're voting against your interests mm -hmm. or Mexican, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah etc. Yep. Those people that are saying that, that are making that claim, are the people who are able to t indoctrinate you and tell you what you should believe about yourself, your situation, and how you should act on it. That's right. So that's why I say that I reject it entirely, because it is a plan to browbeat, to indoctrinate, and to make people vote the way that these people want them to vote. Yeah, I think there's a lot of truth to that. And so whether or not it's kind of true on its face like oh yes of course this thing affects me so it's personal and it is a political thing sure but doesn't that make you least qualified to right. direct no, I the agree discussion with you. but the point is they know that they're the least qualified <laughs> and they use that because those are the most easily molded into their image yeah it's like uh, you, you've mentioned postmodernism a couple times. And the other day, someone tweeted out, what the fuck even is postmodernism? Dits McGee. I love her account. Follow Dits McGee. She is criminally underfollowed. And, and I tweeted back, nothing and everything. Maybe? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for my understanding, postmodernism is sort of this idea that um, what we view as objective truths was formed by a certain echelon of elite people who are also responsible for sort of like all these atrocities. So we should maybe take this idea of them as the bedrock authority with a grain of salt, Yeah, which I think that there is a lot of truth to, um, especially in terms of, and I know I'm going to get a lot of trouble for this, but like things like evolution, um, scientific racism came from that concept. Yeah. So, like, we're not being honest with ourselves, even though we've seen um, evolution later proved in, like, laboratory settings. That doesn't necessarily excuse the theories of Charles Darwin for being responsible for the march of communism and for, you know, Nazism. a lot of the scientific, ra not, you know, scientific racism that led to things like Nazism. So, you know, the left is extremely dishonest about some of the origins of some of these theories. And I'm not trying to say that I don't necessarily think that there's scientific truth to the idea of evolution. I'm just saying that um, people have used science <laughs> as a means to oppress. Uh, it's not a, as as a means to oppress and to to work evil on others. And so it's not like people say, "Listen to the science. Listen to the science." Science is not a religion. It's not a faith system. The science is settled. No, it's not. Anybody who says that does not understand what science right. is. <laughs> it's a tool. It's, it's a thing that you measure things right. with. And at best, it's a, an imperfect understanding of humans about the world around them. Period. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
I mean, you talk to physicists, especially like theoretical physicists, and they'll start talking about some spooky things. There's way more that we don't understand than what we do. Yeah. So people who put this like faith in science, they themselves have not gone through the paces of being an academic scientist. They've simply placed their faith in men yep. who or men or and women <laughs> who uh ha, you know, who they assume are being honest about that. But science like everything else is political and people are seeking funds just like every other politician mm -hmm. and science is you know, a lot of people are talking about it, how um, science is definitely being affected by politics. And the search for funding is tied entirely to ideology. Yeah. And it's not sterile the way that things get researched. So don't fool yourselves into believing that it is. Or you have more faith than a cult. <laughs> it actually makes me think of an episode of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia when they were Love arguing about, I think, the existence of God. And uh, Dennis was saying that you only believe in God because you read a book written by men and you're just trusting them. And then Mac went into this thing where he was like, oh, so you believe in science. Have you ever have you ever seen I'm just going to use an example because I can't remember exactly. Have you ever seen evolution occur? Have you ever seen these yeah. these experiments have you seen the data? Right. Yeah. And he's like, well, I read the book about it. And he's like, so you're reading a book by men that you are trusting Science yep. is a faith. <laughs> it's just like so, yeah, he's right. so good. I, I, I believe in evolution as a process because I studied biology. That was my major in college. Yeah. So that's why I, I know about it. I see a lot of people who believe in evolution, which is different than knowing about it. And that is every bit as much a faith as any kind of religion that's out there. If you just believe in it because scientists have told you so. So I absolutely, I, every time I watch that episode, because I watch Sunny a lot, <laughs> I always say he's right every time. And that's because I have studied biology. So I'm like, you know, don't crack a book before you say you, you believe in something. Right. You know, maybe you should study the evidence first. And also you should look at the history of evolution because it's not necessarily as clean as you think it might be. Oh, yeah. There's a, there have been a lot of atrocities committed under the name of genetic studies and genetic Absolutely. purification. It, and I lay the blame for things like the slave trade directly at the feet of rationalism and the Enlightenment, which caused people to think that they could rationally work out their entire world, which meant like that their moral standards could be based on some kind of like rationalism and allowed them to believe could be measured right and so well clearly you know europeans uh by our standards were clearly superior and so anything that we do to these lower peoples is agreeable because you know it's better for them we're christianizing them we're you know whatever when in fact you're just murdering them and taking their land and stealing their resources so you know it's it it, it needs to be looked at honestly that not everything that comes out of something that calls itself the Enlightenment and something that calls itself rationalism is necessarily a positive thing. Things market them. They market themselves. Yeah, it's not necessarily in true Enlightenment at all. No, 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 it's not. And not everything that comes from ancient people is bad. Yeah. You oh, know, it my God. It, it's what let them survive for millennia without any of the bullshit support system that you were born into. So maybe some of it is rational and works. <laughs> well, and it's like, the, I that's one of the things I hate is when you hear people talk about, well, ancient peoples couldn't have done insert thing here because they're not, they're not as smart as we are. They're not as smart, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, are you kidding me? You think that humans just a thousand years ago didn't have the brain capacity to figure things out, but just had less knowledge than we do now. Because they built our knowledge. The funny thing about that, that hubris that most people carry around with them is that their lives are entirely supported on the capital wealth that their ancestors built for them. Mm -hmm. So those primitive, uh, backwards, ignorant people actually did such a good job at surviving and creating wealth and ease of life for you yeah. That you're able to sit around and pontificate 
about how much smarter you are than they are. But really, honestly, after three days without a hot shower, you would be a cranky bitch <laughs> and completely, you know, three days. I'd be ready I'd, to die. I'd be pissed after a few hours. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> So, you know, I I really despise the denigration of ancient peoples that's done. And that's why I think that there is some truth to postmodernism, because I think that some of our science is based on hubris and some of our history is based on hubris. And it is good to look at that stuff with a critical eye. Yeah, I think but when you approach me with a concept that two plus two is not four, <laughs> I have questions for yeah, you. Yeah, It's like I like Thaddeus Russell. I've liked several of his episodes, mainly the ones with Malice on them, because Malice will call him out for his bullshit. But, like, sometimes I've listened to him and I'm like, how can you say, I, I just, the the absolute rejection of objective reality is so bizarre to me. Like, I cannot wrap my mind around someone looking, like, and this is the argument that people get pissed off, that postmodernists get pissed off about, but it's the argument postmodernists have made to me. That I have to question the fucking table in front of me. It's yeah, there. Yeah. Is a tooth is a toothbrush sexist? You know. <laughs> I just don't have time for that. <laughs> yes. No. And like it's I've it's I've had arguments with different people over time when they'll they'll say something like, "Well, perception is reality," and I'm like, "You your perception is your understanding of reality, but reality is not decided based on your perception." So if we're having a conversation and you take something that I say wrongly, yes, I am in charge of how I said that and if I said it poorly, but it doesn't change the meaning that I said. So yeah, that, um, along, um, among other things, is your perception is just your perception. You can't push that reality on everyone else. Well, that goes a lot toward the way the left talks about intent. And you see a lot of people on the left deciding that they can tell you what your intent is that you might not even yourself know what your intent is, but I'm going to tell you, you're actually a racist. You're actually a sexist. You actually hate trans people. And, you know, that sort of allows them to bend reality to their will. Yeah. And say, oh, no, you know, you're just a poor victim of these old ideas, these Luddite ideas that you hold. It's internalized misogyny. Right, right. <laughs> as, if, as if for any reason some woman might not choose to be different you know, than, than you have chosen to be, which I think was the actual intent of feminism, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's been a fun thread. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I have been making a point of talking about beyond the fact that I do think that the LP is by nature statist is that it's easily one of the most impotent organizations that have ever existed. Like, how do you exist for nearly 50 years and you're still either begging for or bragging about being on a ballot in 50 states yeah i think that's by design like i i say open and often <laughs> i just think that there is too much money at stake for the powers that be to allow it to exist outside of a duopoly. I hate that word so much. <laughs> I know, Ugh. I know. But you know, it's a. It, I, I think the tax take is like four or five trillion dollars that they take in every year. It, it, it's the pot has gotten too big. Yeah. And what politics actually is is the fight over who controls the pot, who controls the kitty. Yeah. And it's a pretty big kitty. Yeah. And it's also who can put people to war so that they can make money for their cronies. War is the health of the empire. Yeah. And the U.S. has never made any pretending about not trying to be exactly as the Roman Empire. Yeah. It's who we emulate. Like, all of our monuments are built exactly as the Romans built their temples. Yep. Look at the um, a the Lincoln mem Memorial? Monument? Memorial. That is a fucking temple with a giant yep. idol. A Roman-style temple, even down to the white eyes of the marble statue which funny enough yeah, I was about to is say. only a yeah a perception of the western world looking back at the classical era through time their statues were actually very colorfully painted yeah. um but off. we see them as these war it wore off and we see them as white marble so we emulated all of our statues after the ruins of empires and so i think in that regard we've sort of made our own bed yeah 
when I talk about the LP being impotent, there's little better example than when Joe Rogan invited Donald Trump and Joe Biden onto his show to have a debate, and Trump immediately was like, yes, I'll do it. Shit, yeah. And Joe Jorgensen didn't tweet at Joe Rogan saying, hey, please include me. She yeah, tweeted shit. at Donald Trump and said, don't you remember when you were part of the Reform Party back in the day that you said it was criminal that third parties didn't get to take part in the debates? She was asking Donald Trump to let her onto Joe Rogan's podcast. Uh, yeah, that's conceding. <laughs> that's conceding to your better it's, at that point. It's like, yes, master, master, please, please allow me. Please, sir. Yes. Please, sir. It's so pathetic. And then, of course, the 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 LP troops are like, oh, well, you know, she needs to be in the debates because they're silencing her because they're scared of her. And the problem isn't that they aren't letting boring Joe speak. It's that she, among other things, she isn't interesting enough to foment excitement in the general population or really the LP may be CIA. But if it's not, it's not enough to elicit derision from the establishment. Like you have to be brave. You have to you yeah. have to make some noise to be noticed. And she's yeah. a dormouse. Yeah, absolutely. Well, she doesn't want to piss off anybody, which is a recipe for no one caring what you have to say. Right. And, and it's like my, my friend Josh said in the episode he was in, or I don't know if he said it then or a, di a different time, but he called her a human white paper. Oh, wow. Like, mm, it's... Poor thing. But that's 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 true. And it's I had my episode on cuties. I mentioned that Tulsi was brave and talked against cuties and against sex trafficking. And Ted played... Ted Cruz played to his base and said that it should be investigated. But where was Joe Jorgensen? This is a moment to be brave. This is a moment nope. where you can say, hey, you know what? Even though there's a na naked dancing man four years ago at the LP convention, we're not actually the degenerates. We want to get rid of this stuff. No, they let Spike go on with his nipples out. <laughs> that pissed me off. I was like, we don't have enough problems being the naked people. You got to go on a podcast with your nipples out. Give me a break. Be brave. Yeah. Why? I, unfortunately... I think it's intentional. I think it's by design. You know, I maybe this is my tinfoil hat thing or whatever, but like I just see nothing but sabotage. And, you know, Bill Weld just kind of like melding right back into the Republican Party. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just it just seems like such a setup to me. Like they, they throw a little bit of money at this thing. So the third party people don't get too riled up and actually put themselves behind some kind of grassroots hero. We wouldn't want that. Yeah. And if it did happen, like we got so, so close. I, I shouldn't say we because I wasn't involved in this. But with Ron Paul, people got really, really close yeah. to that happening. But the corporate media shut him out. He was shut up. He was silenced. Yeah. Yes. And th that's yes. the difference. Ron Paul was brave. And he wasn't a part of the LP at that point. He was ignored when yeah. he ran for the LP ticket in 1988. He was not ignored when he ran as a Republican. No, that was very strategic on his part. I think he was doing his best to actually like win. He thought he had a moment. He was also doing his best to teach. And he did. Yeah. There were college kids screaming about in the Fed and talking about Ludwig von Mises. Yep. What? My husband was a Ron Paul guy. He, the, he, he started reading those people when all of that stuff happened. That was his kind of conversion story to that. But... For me, it took much longer. <laughs> and and, and uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg dies the other day. The other day. Back in January. She died the other day. Yeah. <laughs> People are making these arguments. Oh, well, Mitch McConnell said that they shouldn't vote for Merrick Garland because the people need to make a choice about who they want to be president and let the new president choose. And he should he should stick to his word. And it's like, ha, 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 ha. you really think someone who's in war with you is going to do that for one? Secondly, let's mm -hmm. let's be honest. In 2016, it was a different time anyway. Someone could make the argument that Obama was on his way out and that this, there yeah. was a sea change very clearly of what was going to happen in the future. You can't make that same argument now because Trump is the incumbent and people wanted him and they're still pushing for him. Like it's not the same. Like Barack Obama couldn't have had another term. 
Trump can. People don't historically unseat the sitting president in the middle of a national crisis. That would be historic if that happened. Yeah. Well, it's like uh, George H.W. Bush told his son, you know, if you want to if you want two terms, you have to have a war going on. Well, (laughs) they've given Trump every bit of warfare that he ever needed. But even so, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, back when the Merrick Garland thing was going on, said constitutionally, the president doesn't stop being the president in his last year. The Senate needs to do their job. And Mm -hmm. put in the justice. And so now on her deathbed, her granddaughter happened to hear her say that she didn't want to be replaced until there's a new president. And I'm like, I don't think they're going to wait four years for that. (laughs) Also, I'm definitely making the jack off gesture to that because there's no way in hell that that woman's last words was about (laughs) Donald Trump. I just do not buy that. Could you imagine the patheticness of that? Like if if it was... Even if it was, you don't get to be Supreme Court justice posthumously. You don't get to be past the grave Supreme Court justice. I don't give a fuck what Ruth Bader Ginsburg thinks, because frankly, she's a million years old, just like everybody else in the government. And I don't think has any cons. Like, look, if you don't know how to open a PDF by yourself, you don't get to be in charge of things anymore. That's just the way that it is. If you can't keep your head upright in the middle of a hearing. Mm, yeah. And I appreciate the experience of elders, don't get me wrong, but there's just a certain point where you're dying of 800 types of cancer and, you know, you stay Supreme Court justice and continue to make decisions for 350 million people. Get out of here. It's kind of a lizard person move. Get out of here. Yeah. I gave her three days of mourning, which is (laughs) appropriate to, you give your enemy Three days of mourning to bury their dead and give them proper respects. And that is the honorable thing to do. And I didn't say a negative thing about Ruth Bader Ginsburg for three whole days. And now I am going to roast her old ass (laughs) because that is my right. I did the appropriate funeral rites. How long did I wait? Like six seconds. Yep. (laughs) Yeah. You were like immediate with it. And that's one of those things where people, no offense to gender, but it seems like that's the point women make and it's like but they also there have been several women who've been like why would you make jokes about this why are you celebrating death and it's like hold up i'm not celebrating death i am making jokes these are two different things (laughs) okay well i will point out that in the brad pitt movie troy it was customary for those warrior dudes to give each other proper funeral rites. And that was a big deal between a bunch of Spartan dudes who were like killing each other with swords and shit. So (laughs) yeah, I feel like it was pretty manly to- I'm just saying (laughs) there, I don't believe in too soon because the jokes don't land as well three days later. (laughs) Like I'm sure there are people who made jokes about Jesus after his death. But oh, immediately. But yeah, he, sure. they didn't have three days to wait. <laughs> no, I agree with you. And the reason that Gilbert Gottfried is my favorite comedian of all time is because he told the aristocrats joke like the day after 9-11. Yeah. And I think that was a boss move. Yeah. And he also played Hitler on the roasting of Anne Frank. <laughs> I mean, like he's an amazing comedian. There's it's like you just can't beat the guy. Uh, so it's like and the great part about that is they said uh, Hitler Not only did we have you played by a Jew, we had you played by the most annoying Jew we could find. And Gilbert laughed his ass off at that. He just thought that that was the best joke. Aside, a small aside, why is it that people say that Trump can't take a joke or has thin skin when he literally did a Comedy Central roast? (laughs) The roast. Let's talk about Trump's roast. (laughs) But I'm, I'm just saying... People live in alternate freaking realities. He dishes it out yeah, and he yeah. can take it. You know, you can say you, there's one thing you can't joke about in a roast. It's like, just don't joke about it. He said, don't joke about how much money I actually have. <laughs> because it was his brand. Yeah, he's uh, to me, I get the impression from Trump of like an eighth grade bully. <laughs> so like an eighth grade bully is like a mean kid, right? Yeah. But at the same time, you kind of like have a heart for him because he gets picked on at home and. <laughs> You're like, yeah, I kind of get why you're a dick. <laughs> like, people pick on you a lot. So I get it. Yeah. Obviously, anybody who the apparatus of the state is like this excited to like get rid of, they've pulled out all the stops for this guy. Yeah. 
Like they want him out so bad that they're willing. It came out today. Like they've pretty much proven that the Democrats were colluding with Russia <laughs> to meddle in the election. Are you talking about the dossier? The dossier, the Democrats. Let me repeat this for anybody who didn't quite catch what I said. The Democrats were colluding with the Russians to meddle in the election. Yep. For four years, even to this moment, there are Democrats on Facebook right now talking about how Trump is working with Russians. And they've proved that the Democrats were the ones yep. doing it. Everything that they're projecting is what, like, so I would pay very close attention, everyone, to the fact that they say Trump doesn't want a peaceful transfer of power. I think that they're telling all of us loud and clear that if Joe Biden doesn't, like, landslide win this election they do not have peaceful intentions also hillary clinton kneecapped herself that way in 2016 mm -hmm. made a point of mm -hmm. how you just have to accept the outcome because she was so certain that she was going to win and then as soon as she lost she had no recourse she gave herself no recourse right and so now they're giving themselves permission this time to have recourse yeah and it's it's the last kind of recourse you would want. Oh, one one point about RBG jokes. One of the reasons why I think the jokes are necessary after tyrant deaths is because I don't know if you saw some of the tweets where people were using this death or using other deaths as a way to valorize and create political action immediately. Mm -hmm. Those people need to be yeah. countered. And so sure. I don't know if you saw the tweet that happened almost immediately of someone typing out Ruth Bader Ginsburg greeting Chadwick Boseman. Is that his last name? <laughs> yeah. King. Chadwick <laughs> greeting RBG queen. Yeah. I quote tweeted it and said, John McCain greeting both. Man, it's fucking hot down here. Yeah. So look, I, as a person who would advocate for people to give Ruth her three days of funeral rights, also quite enjoyed a lot of the jokes that were made at her expense. <laughs> so it's not as though, like, you know, I didn't look at that stuff and kind of be like, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, that's just sort of like, that's what I would do. And that's just what I would encourage other people to do. But I'm not like you're a horrible person if you make the make jokes yeah. at her expense. There was a blow up in one of my big groups when John McCain died because we didn't change our opinion about him. No. And... When she died, I was like, I saw a bunch of people saying not to make jokes about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and it was just flashbacks to that horrible time. <laughs> yeah, there was this, um, I can't remember who tweeted it now, and I wish I would so I could give them credit, but he was talking about civic religion mm -hmm. and the way that we kind of make these people into like saints. Yeah. And you even see like the hurricane saint candles with the different politicians Ugh. on them. Like, so I have one of those that's Nicolas Cage, and I know that they're meant to be silly, but at the same time, there's some imagery there that you just kind of can't yeah. shake off. Like, you, you do understand what's being said here. And people worship at that altar. They have replaced God to a large degree with the civic religion, or even worse, they've meddled their God in with their civic yeah. religion. That's when you get, like, the America boomer. Yeah. Trumper type, like conservative Christian types too. So it can go both ways. Oh, yeah. But people have kind of made civics into a religion. And, you know, you've got scientists and people who are like figures of authority who kind of represent the priesthood yeah. of the civic religion. So the politicians, the celebrities, the media personalities, all of the, the people professors. that Michael Malice so expertly refers to as the cathedral, which would be a large collection of religious figures worshiping together. So, yeah, I think that there's something to notice about the zealotry of its believers. I was so happy the other day when I was having a conversation with a couple of different people. And the whole time that we were talking about this, everyone was referring to it as the cathedral. God bless. Which, for a couple of these guys, actually came from hearing me talk about it that way. Which mm -hmm. I got it from Malice, who got it from Mincha Smolbug. But it was an insane moment, because we were all talking about it in the exact same terms, in the exact same way, using the cathedral. And I was like, mm -hmm. 
we're doing something here. What's great about him is he's so positive about it. He told he he constantly says, "Look, don't despair. Mm-hmm. You're realizing all of these things and you're seeing them, which is horrifying, but it means that we're going to win." Yep. If you see them, you're not alone. Yep. Everybody else is starting to see this stuff too. I'm not that smart of a person. <laughs> so I have to believe that the percentage of the population that's at least a little bit smarter than me is seeing that. And that's a significant portion of people. They're noticing what's happening. The only frustrating part is a lot of the people who are smarter than us, who have more advanced degrees or whatever, are typically the people who are actually more indoctrinated. Ah, but I have a counter to that. Okay. Because there is that sort of media class, celebrity class, right? But then there's all the educated people who actually make stuff. The people who are in manufacturing, research and development, those kind of smart yeah. people. The people who are actually making the machines and the... Which is a different smart, for sure. That's a different kind of smart. And those people, by and large, like I don't want to be too specific about what my husband does for a living, but he does research and development. And the people that he works with are some of the smartest people I've ever had the pleasure to be in the room with. And all of those people tend to lean toward, if not liberty-minded values, at least conservative values, which I will take over the march of communism and postmodernism and Marxism. So, you know, the claim that only, you know, dumb, uneducated uh, white women from the South support Trump is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Large portions of the immigrant population support him. Large portions of the very highly educated manufacturing industry support him. Um, I, I, I think that that's a lie because they're scared. That is actually one of my most favorite recent tweets that I wrote because I saw someone tweet that, I think it was a blue check, that it's the uneducated women that are voting for Trump. And I said... When you hear the cathedral or the corporate press call someone uneducated as a means to deride them in their choices, it's because they're going against the cathedral. And instead of reading dumb or stupid when you read uneducated, you need to read less indoctrinated. Yes, absolutely. That's actually great. Bravo. I, I completely agree with that. Because that's what they're doing. They're trying to call people who are not in, who are not a part of their system stupid. Yes. My mom may be in the Trump cult, but I'll be damned if you call her stupid. <laughs> yeah, some of the best people I know are Trump supporters. So the claim that anybody who votes from Trump is both uneducated and racist is provably false. Yes. So maybe you can convince a bunch of uncompromising children that their parents are this, that, and the other thing, but... You know, you're going to have a harder time with that with people who are a little bit older, who've lived a little bit of life. You don't have the millennials anymore, in my opinion. And I think that they are largely going to swing toward a vote that they believe will stem this tide of everybody recognizes that there's a problem. Yeah. Even so this. okay, sorry, I'm getting a little off track here, but I'd like to mention that like even like straight up anarcho uh, communists like tankies. Yeah. They're correctly recognizing that something is really wrong with our system. Yeah. And in that sense, anyone rejecting the two-party ideology can sort of be your ally in that sense. I'm not saying like... Bottom unity. Yeah, bottom unity. You know what I'm saying? So like people recognize that something is going wrong here and we're all translating that in our different ways. Yeah. So those people are ideologically at some level your ally. Yeah. Well, that's that's definitely a very Rothbardian concept, you know, because he, he went to the neoliberals, he went to the uh, paleocons, he went to people who he agreed with one issue on and said, let's yeah. work on this issue together. I've been reading The Conquest of Bread, okay. which is K- Kropkin. That's a that's a red letter communist book if there ever was one. <laughs> and Kropkin is really interesting because I agree with probably 75% of what he writes in the book. Yeah. It, and I've only read a couple of chapters in, so don't like say, you know, I'm partially yeah, communist. Commun- I'm saying that he he directly and correctly identifies some of the problems with a hierarchical oligarchic type system. Yeah. Some of the problems that we're experiencing in the U.S. right now are correctly described by Kropkin in The Conquest of Bread. And it was a wake-up call to me. I said, oh, wow, 
you know, like maybe this whole like communists are entirely my enemy. I have nothing I can learn from them is sort of a narrow and simple minded way to view how I should take in ideas. Yeah. And so I can correctly identify where Kropkin is going wrong and appreciate where he's gone right or where he beautifully describes things that I recognize as problems too. And don't cut yourself off from being able to like wander in the ideological garden. You don't have to subscribe to being a communist to read communist literature. Like you can benefit from it. Yeah. Like give yourself the opportunity to do that. Yeah. Well, in, in the very least, so that you can steal man their arguments and argue against the best argument they have instead of Absolutely. straw manning them. Since RBG is dead, did you go to Joe Jorgensen's website and check out? Have you been to it at all? I went to it the day that they announced her, and it was crashing because they weren't prepared. <laughs> so, so that was the last. That time. was it. <laughs> that was the last time. Oh, and then I got yelled at by a bunch of LP drones. So, <laughs> it didn't inspire me to look further. <laughs> so, on her website, her last news item was her list of possible Supreme Court nominees that she would her list that she would use if she became president. I'm guessing Judge Napolitano was not on I there. did not see him, but there was someone <laughs> on there that I wanted to point out, and that's Alan Dershowitz. Who? Okay, so Alan Dershowitz, he, he went to Harvard. He's a well-known lawyer. He was, on Ep okay. he was on Epstein's flight logs. Okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but here's her. Yeah. Here's how she described him. Alan Dershowitz became the youngest full professor in the history of Harvard Law School at the age of 28. He successfully defended Harry Reams, the actor in Deep Throat, arguing that consumption of pornography was not harmful. He served as defense counsel in numerous high-profile cases, including one against Julian Assange. And that was her pick. Let's talk about not being able to read the room. What person... I don't know that it's that. What person in their right mind wants someone who was on Epstein's flight logs to be a Supreme Court pick? Someone who is intentionally trying to dive bomb any chance that there being popular support for a third party candidate. It's intentionally reading the room. It's, it's, it's so expertly reading the room that you're like, I mean, you, you can't make a movie bad. It's like Tommy Wiseau made your campaign. You have the root. You have the room for a campaign. Here's the thing. I can definitely get behind the concept of the LP being a spook for sure. I'm with you. But I also need to say, if they're fucking not, <laughs> what a bunch of dipshits. But do you even believe that? Like, well, that's the. It's so bad. Like, I feel sorry for every single person that gets excited and screenshots that Mama Joe followed them. Mama Joe, the Batman, like, f fuck. <laughs> you can appreciate that those people are sweet and well-meaning. Like a lot of people who are liberal are sweet and well-meaning. I just feel sorry for them. Some of the people them. that I think are the best uh, humans that I know who are lovely people are politically left and completely snowed by the cathedral and would hate me if they ever actually bothered to like look into my internet history or statements. Yeah. But they're still lovely people and I appreciate them a great deal. I just think that like a lot of people are powerless against this barrage of propaganda because they're raising their kids. Yeah. They're paying their bills. They're living their life and they're not actually absorbed in politics in the way that people like you and I who have some weird, obsessive, fascinating <laughs> interest with politics are. And I can't blame them for just nominally looking at the situation being like, well, no, I don't like racism. Oh, no, I don't like kids in cages. And I didn't know about it until right now. I mean, the, the, the propaganda machine through the use of the corporate press is so effective. Oh, yeah. It got us into World War I. It's, it's incredible the way they will openly bold face lie knowing that there are people out there chirping loudly this is a lie this is a lie i have proof and they're still going to tell the lie because they know that people are more interested in the comforting lie than they are in the uncomfortable truth yep. and you know unfortunately right now there there is a big market for comfortable lies yeah and unfortunately 
you can't go on your Facebook right now and be honest about the fact that new information has come out about the Breonna Taylor case. Yeah. You can't say, hey, they found new fa- <laughs> like new facts that you didn't know before because the press lied to your face. Yeah. And you didn't know this, so you formulated opinion based on a lie, purposefully. So when you, we can laugh at the idea that the LP is not a spook, but you see provably that everything around you is a spook. Yeah. It's like all of it is a gossamer, rose-colored fantasy directed to either make you upset or make you feel comfortable. We've been talking for almost two hours, so we, I don't think we can go into it too deeply. Damn. But I think most people are missing the point with Brianna Taylor. I think people are saying things like no knock raids need to end. That's true. No knock raids shouldn't mm-hmm. happen. But people are missing that no knock raids are a symptom of the drug war and came out of mm-hmm. the drug war and were legitimized yep. and propagated by the drug war. I'll be honest with you. If I was her boyfriend, husband, whatever, and I was sitting in my house and then I heard bang, 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 police and then the door was down, I'd be shooting too. Because, I mean, regardless of whether or not they knocked or said or announced themselves, the police were home invaders and home invaders in my house get bullets. So unfortunately, because the corporate press is not interested in whether you live or die, whether innocent people are harmed or whether cities burn down, a lot of myths and untrue things about the Breonna Taylor case were put out. And the Washington Post, surprisingly, actually did a really good job. They put out an article that kind of goes through the facts of the Breonna Taylor case and lays out some of the things we've all been told, all believe, all have heard are based on sort of like the propaganda machine of the corporate press. And they're like, for example, there are two boyfriends in this scenario. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of people know that. So there's facts being tossed around this case that are factually true without the understanding that there are two different men involved in this scenario. There's also the judge who signed the warrant. There's a lot of copy pasta that goes on with with those kind of things. Everybody's doing a really good job to say, I'm not responsible for this. And no one's sort of taking responsibility for a innocent woman who got murdered. And the, the state has failed her. The press has failed her. Her ex-boyfriend failed her the only person that did write by brianna taylor was her boyfriend mr walker who laid his life on the line to try to defend her and in my mind that is a good man and a hero and he's being maligned as like a drug dealer because nobody's bothering to look into the facts of the case and understand that there are actually two men involved in the scenario and one of them is like a drug dealer and goes to jail a lot and one of them is just a man who fell in love with a woman and one night the police broke into the house yeah. and he didn't know that they were cops it's a terrible tragedy this but it's just there are so many parts to this but the overall part that i think is important is One, yes, the judge signed a no-knock warrant. So whether or not they knocked right before, which 11 out of the 12 witnesses say they didn't, one said they did. They heard him knock and announce themselves. And so I guess Mm -hmm. one witness plus three cops is somehow more than 11 other people. But the the point is, I would lay this at so many feet before I would Kenneth Walker. I would, I would lay it at the feet of the judge, especially. Any judge who signs a no-knock warrant, fuck you. They did the same thing to Duncan Limp. Yep. And that is much more clean example of police misuse of power. Yeah. But it won't ever get brought up in the press, and we know why. Yeah. And like to belabor the point, we know why. Yeah. Because it doesn't generate the kind of hysteria that, you know, so <laughs> certain skin yeah. color yeah. is more, plays better in the press. Yeah. And that's what we've allowed ourselves to become victims to. Yeah, or Daniel Shaver, who was shot in that hallway. And the cop who shot him now gets a pension because he got he he got brought back onto the force so he could work long enough so that he could get his pension because he claimed that he got PTSD from shooting Daniel Shaver. <laughs> yeah, except for he had the words get fucked yeah. carved into his rifle is what I've heard. Yeah, and I think so. that that is exactly what he should do. Yeah, me too. But, you know, this guy's got to go through the rest of his life with his face. Yeah. And so a lot of people have seen that face. And then you also have repercussions from the culture and the society, too. 
and everybody hates you. So good luck. You know, that's all I have to say about that. And so I think to wrap up, we've had a good conversation about several things. And I think the thing that we should take away from this, the most important aspect is that Titty Pussy should become the president of the United States. I would like to take this moment to formally endorse Titty Pussy (laughs) for president of the United States in the 2020 election. (laughs) I think I'll actually march my ass down to the voting booth at the local church where I will write Titty Pussy if if allowed. See, if I remember correctly, last time you had to just push a screen Mm -hmm. and there was no opportunity to write anything in. So I don't know if I'll get the opportunity. Well, with mail-in ballots... and all the things that are going in, I think we need to officially start the write-in campaign for Titty Pussy for president. That Titty is, Pussy for president. I will vote for Titty Pussy. I'm going to put it out on my Twitter right now. T- <laughs> Titty Pussy 2020. So. Oh my God. To close us out, I've asked you my pedophile question. Uh-huh. So now I have my other question. What? Okay, go and ahead. And it's a malice question. I'm not going to lie. What okay. is your favorite thing about me? My favorite thing about you? Yeah. Oh, Okay. It's that you're actually willing to have philosophical and interesting conversations about the Bible without getting all weird or personal about it. The Bible is an interesting historical topic, an academic topic. And, you know, it's something that people should open up and look at because it's a beautiful work of literature. It's an incredible work of literature. And it influenced everything about the modern world. And so much of what we do subconsciously is based in Christianity. Mm -hmm. And you might find a lot of your social justice warrior morality actually was, you know, the inception of that comes from that book. That desire to yeah. take care of people who are in a weak position comes from that book. Yeah. And so. it was it was destroyed by Woodrow Wilson and his social gospel. And that's where we the got The worst it. president we've ever, ever had yeah. is Woodrow Wilson. Yeah. <laughs> he got it from that, which he got from the Puritans, which is where we are today. All right, Jessica. Thank you for coming back onto my show. I don't know if I've told you this, but I am going to have guests that I haven't talked to very much before on the show, but I think my tact is going to be to have people that I enjoy just be regulars for the most part. Oh, fine. So when I get to a point where there's like someone I want to talk to, I will have them on, but I'll also probably bring on one of my regulars to be a part of that conversation. So yeah, if you're down, feel free to say no. I want you on my roster. Anytime. I, I always have a great amount of fun during these conversations, <laughs> so I'm willing to do this all the time. Sweet. You can find Jessica on Twitter at LibdKitWitch. That's L-I-B-T-K-I-T-W-I-T-C-H. It's short for Libertarian Kitchen Witch. You can just type If that you type in. that into the search bar, you, you'll find me, Libertarian Kitchen Witch. But also Jessica Green yeah. is my name, so you can find me that way too. And you can find her um, every now and then show on YouTube, The Jessica Green Show. And she is Mm -hmm. a super fun person. So find her and tweet at her because she's got some some fire tweets. (laughs) And as always, if you want to find me, just type in This Is MLGA literally anywhere. Well, except for Parlor, because fuck that. I feel like that's a spook. Mm -hmm. I have a real spooky feeling about that. But everywhere major. Type in this is MLGA. If you want to send me an email, cam at MLGANetwork.com. And if you want to give me money, I want that. So, you know, Patreon exists. <laughs> Lots of money. <laughs> Cam's money. <laughs> Daddy needs more liquor. <laughs> so, again, thank you, Jessica. And thank you for listening. And as always, stay sane. Yeah.